Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another segment on In Conversation With. This segment is specially designed to showcase the backstories and journeys of individuals who have made an impact in the field of expertise. The Luminary Learning Solutions crafted this segment to offer you the advantage of drawing inspiration for your own personal journey. I'm Anton Thalen, the Chief Evangelist and the host of this hour. My guest for today's segment, and it is my pleasure to introduce Shweta Chari. Just a little background on Shweta before we dive into the conversation. She is a co-founder and CEO of Toy, Blank, Toy Bank. Development through play is their tagline. Now, every great journey starts with a tiny step. And Shweta started with a simple thought. She wanted to ensure that every child had a toy. And after, completed, or after having completed her engineering courses in 2004, she decided that rather than attaining an IT job in the US, her real calling was in to put her one simple thought into action and thus now handles Toy Bank's core strategies. The organization, armed with the belief that giving underprivileged children toys results in the betterment of society, aims at procuring toys from the children with plenty of access to them and giving it to those children who lack toys. The organization currently operates in six cities with over 70,000 children now having access to the organization. So Shweta, thank you for being here with us today. We really do appreciate that. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, I, I mean, like I said, you know, when we had our initial initial chat and said, you were spotted by my son Dorian, um, who watched you on Nat Geo and, and was excited about what your organization was doing. And then he stood on his head and said, you know, you need to you need to meet this lady. And then she's doing some really great job. So I said, okay. So we 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 did some digging around to find out who is Shweta Chauri and and what is this toy bank all about? And as they say, the rest is history. And here we are. So before we kind of dive into that conversation, Shweta, do tell us you know, a little bit about you. I mean, who is Shweta Chauri? Or what was it like growing up? Um, first of all, thanks a lot to your son <laughs> to have spotted me. And um, what a lovely way to get introduced to you through a, through a kid and through the eyes of a child. So that's amazing. Um, I, it's, it, mine's not, um, it's a really simple story. Uh, it's a story of, um, of a kid uh, who grew up in um, uh, probably like a, a slightly happy environment. I was one of those kids that went to a very good school uh, back home, I mean, in Bombay in India. And, um, had access to a bit too much maybe for my age and maybe to some extent even spoiled, um, which was nicely called out and identified by a very dear uncle of mine who is literally one of those people who um, I give the entire credit to him, um, in especially my growing years and the adult years when I look back. Thanks to him, he taught me a lot about real life in a sense. So um, I started volunteering at a very young age when I was about eight years or nine years, very, very early on in school, um, doing very simple things at that age was simply like collecting money for some charity I had no idea about. And then as I grew up, uh, there was more physical volunteering uh, in, the, in the secondary schooling years. But again, the reasoning was only so that um, it somewhere aligns with good grades, and maybe, uh, you know, good, um, uh, what do you call it, reputation in that sense in the school. But the reason was not really to solve out for the problem. So then as I grew up, uh, thanks to this uncle of mine who got me a sense uh, of the realities of the world, when I actually started venturing more into uh, the interiors uh, of India, traveled around a little bit um, in the urban slum communities, um, started engaging directly with uh, people uh, whom I used to, uh, you know, be scared of maybe to talk to. But it sort of opened a, 
a certain dimension and i didn't know where this was leading because i did end up, end up doing engineering and the whole idea was to like go abroad and do my masters i even got a job over here but i think post my engineering the last viva literally of the last exam um i felt a certain need to now truly do something that my spirit would be happy doing and uh, not what was conventionally the right thing to do so and there was a big kind of um a confusion and a, a flux i was going through uh internally because i was sure I, of what i didn't want to do but i wasn't sure of what i wanted to do so it became a little um, difficult those days but thankfully my mom had my, had a lot of patience with me and um, she i took permission to just uh, allow her to give me a, a year so as to figure out what i could do with my time because i knew that i wanted to do something which was purposeful but purpose was for whom um it was always putting myself ahead it was all about me so um i was always caught sure. up with this a uh, confusion of what do i really want to do so that really how it all started out well <laughs> interesting though but agreed that you know you picked up engineering but clearly you felt that was not your call and 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 in your own words you wanted to do something but you're not sure exactly what that something was right but where did you where did you get the inspiration to to get into toy bank i mean of all the things that you could have possibly done whether it was engineering whether it's it's something related to that but there is no relevance to engineering and toy bank at least from where i see it and then from what you are doing right now but where did that inspiration come in from um i don't know if now you can call it inspiration and in all the words you can but i think at the time it was just ignorance and stupidity um <laughs> Because enough. <laughs> didn't, didn't think through anything, which is a good thing in its own way. Um, I think one of the key things in the four years of engineering is to keep asking is, so how is this going to help anyone else? How is this going to help anyone? Else? Because I lack the vision of a true engineer who would actually be building and doing things um, at a different scale, maybe, and is able to envision that. I just couldn't figure out in all of humanity how am I? What am whatever I'm studying now? How is it going to be applicable to? say a child who has no clothes is not even eating food and is on the streets how is it going to help that kid um sure. i just could not bear the thought that i was doing something that did not really solve for that problem that i was seeing immediately in front of me so it was this desperate need to feel useful if i may say so immediately not just in the long run in a long term point of view at least at the time in 2004 when i was just 21 there was a desperate need to feel useful and um, i think it also stemmed from a certain selfishness because it also got to do it had it had to do with with how do i feel it's like i have to feel good i need to feel useful i need to be uh, doing something about this versus what is really the need of the hour for that child does she or he want this help does he what kind of help does he need it was never from the point of view of of the the person we want to help it was only from the point of view of what i wanted to do very input oriented so but having said that um i started volunteering as soon as i finished my last viva exam of my engine literally that very day okay. i uh, ran into one of these homes which is very close to my house um i kept passing it by through the years of engineering wondering what this is i could see some little kids playing from afar but eventually i on that very day i summed up some courage and went inside and inquired turns out it was a non profit that uh, okay. uh, worked with young uh, children and uh, they would you know do tuition classes and different things for kids on a daily basis so i took permission from them introduce myself with my background they said hey you can come and start teaching maths if you're okay but we need you to be consistent um can you come sure. and teach us children maths because that's a subject they struggle with so i i was very excited i said yes the very next day i went ardently with my i revised my school early school maths and stuff and i started going uh, on a daily basis to this particular uh, uh, organization and um, what happened uh, anton is none of these kids 
uh, over the period of uh, the few weeks that I, I, I went, none of these kids really bothered about me. So now I think they got bored of me. Either I was a bad teacher or that they were just kind of disinterested uh, in the subject. I mean, bad teachers, uh, uh, I mean, I think it, is, it must have been true because um, none of these kids really even knew my name properly. And they didn't even, I didn't know anybody properly. It was just, I didn't make any sin and add up. So I felt again frustrated. I wanted to go ahead and felt very selfish, selfishly frustrated that I'm giving my time. I'm trying to do something. And none of these kids even care for me and value my time and all that. I came from that space. But then uh, after a few weeks, I actually paused to see what is really going on over here. And why are these kids not showing interest in, is it just me or is it other subjects also? So for a few days, I just observed. I took permission again to take time up and just observe. And I realized, like me, there were so many tuition teachers coming and going and uh, doing different subjects. And the kids were studying. They were going to school, some local school they were going to. So then it occurred to me, when are they playing? When are they getting to be kids? What's really going on on the recreation piece of the whole thing? Because everybody is only like academic, academics, academic education in India is very like, you know, pro education, which is superb. But what about recreation? So then I took permission and I said, hey, you know what? You have enough teachers coming and teaching these kids. I would just like to spend some time playing with them. Is that okay? Again, there was no toy bank. It was just an idea of play. I was heavily into music. Um, I used to play the violin and I used to listen to a lot of Jim Morrison those days. And I used to go to um, classical, oh, nice. Indian classical concerts. Yeah, I was heavily into music. We had a, a, a band of ours in engineering uh, and we I used to perform gothic rock in some of these concerts. Those were some days. But I took permission from um, these uh, people and I said, you know what, I just want to try this out. So the next day I took um, different genres of music. I took uh, I was heavily into Indian classical, so Bhimsen Joshi, including uh, the 60s and 70s classic rock. And uh, I took my computer speakers and my disc man back then, and I sat them down and I showed them what is this, what is that, and what's the difference between each of these genres. So many conversations started happening. In the days ahead, we used to, start, we used to play box cricket. Um, then we used to play all these old Indian games called Sakli and uh, uh, all those funny odd games. Um, uh, it was good fun. And uh, then I realized through this, the kids were not even just opening up, but trusting me so much more. They started basically looking forward to having me spend some time with them and having these sessions. The kids started telling me their stories. I don't know how many, I mean, in this audience, or how, if you've seen this movie called Lion, uh, where the child just sits in a train mm. and is, you know. So these were those children. These were real children I'm seeing who have parents or maybe a parent not necessarily orphans, but have consciously taken the choice to jump into a train and just come to Bombay, to into to, to Mumbai, this, this city of this blink of city. Oh, I they, see. Okay. They wanted to come and make it big. Um, many of them aspire to grow up and become Salman Khan, um, very specifically. So, so I've, I've got to, I've got to ask you this. So this is, these are stories that, that you've kind of, elicited out of these children while playing music and while playing games and etc. Is it? Is that, yes. is that what you're telling us? Yes. So, I mean, clear, clearly, clearly. So you're, you, didn't, you didn't do any studies in, in child psyche mm -hmm. and, and you kind of picked this up along the way, right? But, but listening to your story, and I can't help but ask you, what were you... I mean, yes, you were diving in and, and you were having an interesting time. You, you were giving them the play time because that was missing. And, and here you are sitting and kind of understanding these kids. And, and, you know, like you said, maybe they have parents. Maybe it's just a single parent. Maybe they just don't want to be and, and they want to make it big. And clearly these kids have some drive or inspiration or some dream. OK, but what is it that you were hoping to achieve at that point? in time what were you hoping to achieve by doing uh, what you were doing good question uh, i think if i really dig deep and um i think hard i think one of the things i really wanted to do was for these kids to be kids again um i could see mm. that they had grown up too soon and for being just like seven, eight, nine year old little boys, they were they were young boys. They were growing, they were talking and behaving like they were young adults. 
and talking about life in a way that was shocking for a young child and where did their childhood go and it just disappeared so i think i just i absolutely and most badly wanted these children to have happier memories and feel like children again so and whatever i could do to 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 remind them of that i think that was what was happening subconsciously uh, i don't think i was mindfully doing this uh, in hindsight i can tell you this uh, now and also resource fund because when these kids are kids and they're playing i mean the innocence just comes out so naturally and they're so beautiful and uh, so honest and um, it just got the best out of me as well so i think it was a two way two way um uh, impact in a way i mean it was a two way change that happened yeah and and, and it's always great to have a uh, an experience where not only you are giving back something but you're also learning in the process and i think that's an amazing experience right but if i if i if i kind of put numbers together and and you yourself were a kid at that point <laughs> um you know engineering college you know you you couldn't have been you know a real adult so to speak so as a youngster looking at these kids and then as you said you know they want to be a salman khan they want to be the sharuk khan they want to be the tendulkar and etc but in that in that aim of creating uh, an impact did you at that point and i'm just taking you back did you really believe that what you were doing would actually invoke say resilience or or you know be able to lift these kids out of poverty to to kind of get them up there and and be able to follow their dream and and pursue and work hard towards achieving that was that something you truly believed in or did that sort of come around uh, as as a as a result of what you were doing absolutely not at the time none of these thoughts came to me at that point um there was no big picture if you know i may say so like about bringing about permanent change and hopefully a better life for these kids it was very momentary it was just about bettering that current moment that we were all in together because i was so lost myself at 21 i was just getting my bearings of what i wanted to do next um I, so i means i don't i never thought through this at the time i just knew i had to do this and i knew when i did it um it had amazing uh, immediate result and uh, that looked good that felt good um and i think it was the right thing to do um so i continued to do it um even in the years that even in the months and years that followed this experience i never thought through anything in fact the funniest thing now when i look back from 2004 to to about 2009 end so early 2010 we never even registered this as a charity it was entirely done um out of free will and free spirit we put i mean when i say we we were a bunch of volunteers that got together eventually and we used to keep doing this i had a full time job i worked in the corporate sector i also knew that i had to work because i needed to be financially independent um and be able to feel good about myself in terms of my own financial independence um i had a degree so um it helped in uh, you know having some stability in terms of a, a regular income um i wasn't keenly excited about the jobs that i was doing but i was always excited about the saturdays and sundays because it was a time i could spend with these kids and um you know uh, be able to volunteer so um it gave me a per sense of purpose and i felt responsible for somebody else um uh, even though those somebody else kept changing every week because we kept working with so many different kids as we moved along but it got me a certain sense of understanding of the importance of this particular thing that we are doing um if we stop doing it that many children are losing out on their childhoods and that thought i just couldn't get out of my brain so i had to do this so whatever job i used to take up um i was very it was very important for me to see how much time i got uh, in my free time to actually do this so it was it was uh, it was just ridiculous obsession uh, back then <laughs> and then interesting though this this whole concept of of toys and and you ventured into it and and yes you started making toys and i guess that's a story that everyone knows but 
You know, what interests me is that you, you have a particular choice in the type of toys that you collect. Why is that? What, what is the story behind that? Yeah. Um, so actually, so I'll tell you about the toys because uh, the, the piece of toys, because we are a lot more into games. So, um, but in the aspect of the early days when we purely, as the name suggests, uh, toy bank, we were a bank of toys. Um, we were very, very careful of not be, not giving our children lifestyle uh, influencing toys. Nice. Uh, very, very careful of that. You know, if a, if, if a doll comes with a house, if a doll comes with a roof on her head and has fancy kitchens and fancy bedrooms and all of these things and fancy clothes, but a real child doesn't even have like 20% of all of these things. How fair is that? Um, and we felt very, uh, it felt very, very um, actually disheartening because if a toy can be all of these things, unfortunately our real children are actually losing out on so many important aspects. Forget about the lifestyles. Um, also the body image piece was an extremely important aspect because many of the girls we used to work with May, they, they, they may or may not have guardians to tell them what's right from wrong. Um, and it's, uh, they're very, I mean, they get very influenced by Bollywood in this country. And everything becomes about the look and, you know, especially for the girls, it, they have it really bad because uh, they start believing in their own body image and that they are they're not good enough. Or they're, so I think the toys and games have tremendous influence on how we make our children of what we make them think and what we can make them believe in and about themselves. We also stopped accepting games that promoted violence, any kind of violence, even visually, like not just toy guns and things, but because you know what, these are things that children um, uh, uh, kind of um, emulate. They, they look at movies and they think, so we had an incident once, one kid, uh, we used to ask these kids when they used to receive the toys and games in the early days of Toy Bank, ki, um, you know, what would you like to, what is your aspiration? What's your dream? Do you, what, do you have any thought about what you'd like to be when you grow up? And conversations around that. Many of these kids used to come and say, I'd like to be a pilot, especially the girl kids used to come and say, I want to fly a plane. And, you know, we used to kind of match the aspiration with the toy. So he'll get a, he would get, he or she would get a plane. Um, and if he wants to, I want to grow up and become Tendulkar, then, you know, we would probably give them a cricket bat and things like that. This was the very, very early days, of course. There's a lot of evolution that's happened after. One of the kids came up to us and said that I would like to grow up and become a, a cop because there are a lot of bad elements in my community. And I would like to put them, uh, you know, behind bars and clean up my community and things. So that was like so positive. Like, oh, that sounds good. But imagine like uh, we were also so, we, I think we were really naive at, at the time, um, but we did give a toy gun at that time to the child. This was the absolute first year of our work. And uh, a child after came, after this kid came up and came up to me and said, before we could even ask the question, he straight away said, I want to grow up and become a goon. Um, that's a good thing for me because he was surrounded in living and growing up in that environment which was normalized. So he demanded for a gun. So it got us thinking a wow. lot. You know, it's, yeah, it's like, so we got to think a lot about how <laughs> these kids are so innocent and what is, there's not, it's not their fault. So um, we are very careful, yeah. mindful of the kind of material, kind of images uh, our children see in games and, uh, and the toys they play with. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Interesting, huh? Um, and, and, and listening to these stories always makes you wonder, right? And, and I guess as part of your role or the work that you do, um, I'm guessing you do sort of work with therapists, you do work with behavioral analysts, etc., cetera, um, to kind of assess and help youngsters or these young kids, right? But could you, could I, since you mentioned this particular story about you know, the guns, cops, and goons. Um, could you tell us an example or a story of something that kind of resonated with you as an individual based on your background, your growing up? Um, I think, so I, So for me, it was, 
I don't know how to say this, but even after doing this for so many years, like um, this is this is uh, I weep a lot when I see children um, who are struggling. Um, it's not necessarily that they are poor; they are growing up in slum communities, or they have it. Sure. I think it's just generally for children. I think what's their fault, right? So for me, it's like I always come from the space that's not the child's fault. Um, okay. And you know, we've defined and built this this so-called world and the regulations and rules in this world. And what is the child's fault? We brought this child into this world, and and now we expect okay. the child to be all of these things. So I feel I feel extremely. I'm very broken when I see. Uh, it takes me a second, even if I, 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 I even if I see, I watch news uh, and see children, um, you know, in war-torn countries or like now. I just saw an image the other day of a child in in this pandemic, like standing in line for his grandmother to be able to 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 get vaccinated. And this is and this. I, mean, I don't know. I just I don't know. I feel like these children are like put into so much of nonsense. Um, it starts there. Our world gets defined by what the child is experiencing at his or her early sure. ages. So I think for me personally, it was I grew up. Uh, I am an, an only child, and I uh, had a lot of time to myself. And um, I had, a, I mean, I come from a broken home as well, and I had a lot of time to uh, reflect and do things, um, explore life on my own. So. I also I, I also kind of grew up into a far more I mean now I can say this and I can constantly say this with humility is that there's a lot of resilience um, and there's a lot of understanding of um, uh, situations and circumstances more empathy um, I don't try my best at least consciously to not take uh, people in situations for granted because everybody every single person however little big small age anything has a big backstory and uh, it's extremely important for all of us to be mindful of that. So that's something that sort of stays with me, has stayed with me through my schooling years and early college days and all of that. I have very few friends. Um, I get, I used to read a lot um, in the earlier years. Uh, I, I remember reading Albert Camus and, uh, and, um, uh, and such books especially the book Outsider had a big influence on my head. You know, these were things in, if you read in early teens and late teens, they really have a kind of a, a tuning that goes on in the, in, in the head. So I don't know, I just, I guess I was extremely lucky to have had the opportunity uh, to be able to explore my world, my immediate world around me um, uh, without too sure. much of influence of, others except for my uncle though he, he had a big influence on me thanks to him I actually was able to read a lot of books and have conversations around how can I live a, a life that is more purposeful those conversations really got me to to whatever I'm doing today and and, and I, I I understand that and I hear you loud and clear right and and you know to get into that kind of a role um, it's not easy right and you're right. I guess one of the biggest lessons we get out of that is the fact that we can't be judgmental. And then it's something that, you know, in our line of work where we facilitate learning for, for organizations and something that we constantly talk about is that we assume and, and we are judgmental. We're quick to pass judgment and it's quite difficult. And when you really sit down and look at the nitty gritties and you look at the backstories and you realize the behaviors that they project, um, you know, it's got a lot to do with their culture, the backgrounds that they come in from. And, you know, kids watch people um, and, and pick up sense from role models or even if it's not a role model per se, they watch people. So like the youngster that you said, I want to be a goon, clearly was surrounded by that kind of individuals. And, and that's the only reference point they have, right? Uh, and, and they wouldn't know anything otherwise. And I guess the biggest influence of all is, is, is the, you know, is the cinemas. Uh, in your case, it's Bollywood. I guess for many parts of the world, it's Bollywood. And, and everyone thinks, you know, good or bad. And that's your reference because you have no other reference. But my, my question is, great, you've got this whole drive. And, and yes, you've identified 
the 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 psyche behind what's happening or the child psyche behind what's happening and and you have an idea you know exactly what needs to be done and here you are because it built your resilience based on your upbringing or based on your childhood you now see a, a kind of a common ground but it couldn't have been easy i mean you must have had your share of challenges and and where i'm coming from is from when you started to where you are today there's clearly a number of milestones that you would have achieved and that's always a success story there's always something that brings the smile when you reach a particular milestone but i'm i'm pretty confident that each of them would have had their challenges but what would you say were your your can i say biggest challenge to kind of get to where you are today um <laughs> um i mean there are so many ways of looking at yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> go I, on sorry go on so if it's not one you could tell me a few but just to understand if if somebody was to come in and and do something be inspired by what you are doing what can they expect i guess that's the other way of looking at it because it it couldn't have been easy it couldn't have been as simple as right you know what collect a toy give a toy and you know bobs your uncle you are done i'm sure it was not as simple as that no it wasn't and it isn't uh, tell us about <laughs> it we evolved also as an organization so i think um, uh, so first of all i must say that i was very very lucky first of all to have bumped into a bunch of really good people uh in the earlier years that sort of helped to nudge me in the right direction threw me in the right path on the right path um none of us are born at least I, i can talk for myself like with this whole natural instinct of running an organization sure. and in the earlier years we purely volunteers so uh one nudge i got in 2009 was from an individual who said hey you know what you should register this as a charity if you run this as a charity you'll be able to do much more work um it's caught on and i by back then we had already scaled up to many many states in india so um and and as volunteers so i said okay why not i think one of the things also that work is ignorance is bliss <laughs> so it's <laughs> so much back then i think the challenges have been very many one of the it sounds very i don't know how to explain or try to articulate this one challenge i always have is in articulating sometimes the big vision for me it's like so simple it's like it's so simple but then when you get down to doing it it's like 50 year journey or 20 year journey or like Oh, this is going to take so much time. I feel like we human beings waste so much of time. Uh, you know, analysis leads to paralysis, as they say. So there is so much of analysis, and I'm not saying don't plan and don't do and stuff. It's important, but I guess that's one of the biggest things. Is you have to once you start. Initially, was not the easiest because everybody's like, they love your energy, they love your drive. They're like, oh, what a cool idea! Let's do this. Let's do this. Then the minute you start doing it and you're doing so well. that we evolved into an organization that sets up proper play to learn centers uh within the premises of other government schools it's not just about collecting and distributing toys we actually evolved into curating our play centers to address behavioral needs in children so it's evolved into so many areas so we did the excitement and the momentum was we were charged up so i was like let's do this it was never like it's too tough or it's too high a wall to climb none of those things so and then as we kept doing the the excitement and the drive hasn't died but the environment keeps changing and you have evolved as a person it's like the congruence model like you have to understand that and this is a big learning for me as well that the environment keeps changing so you're not talking you're talking about the same problem but a new in a new environment in a new context that keeps changing so you need to also keep evolving when it comes to what is the problem you're trying to solve because that is also going through its own evolution so sure. it's important to change the i feel and that's a huge challenge that i have i have had to deal with is this understanding and assimilating for myself that we have to be mindful of whom we go to 
to seek help. I, I've ended up wasting a lot of time in uh, trying to convince the wrong doors, if I may say so. Correct. But I know I could have sometimes really done it by myself. There is this self-doubt that starts setting in maybe with, I don't know, it's, it's got to do with age or it's just the surroundings, people that you, that you surround yourself with. So I think one of the biggest challenges I've had to deal with is that, that to have more faith, don't be, be humble, but that fine line of humility and being confident that I know what I'm doing. I just have to keep doing it. I just have to be at it. But as you get older, everybody tells you otherwise, that it's almost like, like you forget the plot and then you start self-doubting. And I think that was, those are some of the challenges that continuously keep happening even now. In interesting that you, that you spoke about knocking on doors and, and trying to kind of identify the right kind of door, right? So clearly you can't do this just by yourself at the scale that you want to do it at. And, and you do need corporates to come in and, and support. How do, you, how do you go about getting your corporates and, and how do you ensure that, you know, one of the biggest challenges and it's something that, you know, both, both Bidush and myself have always talked about and, and something that we are always, you know, having an issue with is that charity is not just a one-off thing you know, going and doing something on a particular day, great, feels good. And, and generally corporates tend to sort of tick that as, as, a, as a CSR, but eventually that's not what you're looking for. And, and you're looking at something that's sustainable, right? How do you ensure that you get corporates to A, sign up to, to join your cause, but how do you also ensure at the same time that this is something continuous rather than a one-off um, or, or a tick in the box exercise. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, uh, so. Step number one is we uh, don't uh, go to corporates or funders with this um, agenda that we need money or we need your money or you need to support us, and that's how it. That's just not the thing for us. So we've never done any cold calls or pitches or gone and made proposals arbitrarily and just met people with this whole thing that, hey, this is who we are. We've never done that historically. Um, lucky for us, maybe, or I don't know what, but the approach always has been uh, that, hey, why don't you come and volunteer with us? Hey, why don't you come and see the work with your own eyes, get involved, you know, be physically present. You mean, I mean we don't want you to do some wonder world work, but it'll be wonderful if you can, uh, you know, uh, be a part of our world for a little bit, walk our shoes, see the entire back end, get a glimpse of how things happen in our inventory, for example. It's very intense work because we're we're working with over 50,000 children on a daily basis and the volume of work is quite high. And we are, it, for us, 50,000 is nothing still because there is millions of kids that we still need to reach out to and there's so much work charted out. So we request these people to come and just spend time volunteering with us for a period of time. And, um, and naturally the conversations lead you to you're convinced that hey you know what because the the philosophy is this is not my organization this is not my problem this is your organization this is our problem so it's like it's a kind of a thing sure. right like if i'm helping you i'm helping myself um if we treat each other like co-humans uh there's a different lens you're seeing the world from then and i feel that it's extremely important i remember doing this little talk um with, uh, you know, the Singapore delegation used to come and we used to every other year have these conversations with some of the uh, ministry level uh, people. Um, and it was an amazing session we used to have. And one of the things we always said is it's not about us and you. It's, a, it's, it's not like we are different, you're different. Yes, maybe geographies are different, our lifestyles are different, all that. but at the end of the day, we're in the same planet. So this whole approach of my problem is your problem and vice versa and can we solve out to help each other therefore to create a much better environment as a whole um that's how we do it even with the corporates you are not helping us but you're helping the society at large we are probably enablers we are doing this 24 7 we, we we love it this is this is our calling this is our passion this is what we want to do but can you what's your part in all of these things is something that you can decide if you don't want to play a part also a call you can take point being is unless you see it and unless you feel it 
um, you won't be able to take these decisions on your uh, uh, independently. So it's extremely important for us, for them to be a part of this whole process. And that is how we've been doing it for all these years. And so far, so good. It's always, it's, it's been, we've had, we've struck some amazing relationships in the whole process. We've struck some amazing conversations. Um, we are also not an organization that really promotes and propagates and does a lot of, uh, so, you know, uh, advertisements and uh, we, don't, we don't play the drums uh, at all, in fact, not even loud. So it's like, unless, it's, it's, it's a very personal interest that sort of gets generated and those are the kind of relationships that have lasted the test of time. And some go all the way to a decade. So it's been um, right. very gratifying, very purposeful and very sustainable too. I, I, I must say, I, I love the model. I love the philosophy of this is not, you know, my company. It, it is your company. Um, it's not my problem. It's our problem, which kind of br- instills or brings about the thought that, you know, what are you doing for your for your own society, the environment that you live in? But it's brilliant to see that the relationship with some of your corporates going back decades. And 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 I can't help but ask or want to ask you, you know, when when you kind of have that whole come in, enjoy, you know, come in, spend a day with us, look at how we do our work, you know, walk the you know walk the floors in our shoes see what's happening behind the doors and, and get involved. Um, have you had experience or, you know, examples or feedback, I, I don't know, where corporates who've come in and have done that or got their staff to come in and do this as a, as a long-term project, sort of going back and, and changing attitudes, behaviors, where not just what they do for the society as a whole, but individuals changing in a manner where they go back to their own organizations, behave in a manner that changes now the approach and where the organization as a whole has benefited. Would you have any stories that, that kind of resonates in that level? Yeah, many, 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 many stories. I can tell you one example of one of the things we keep getting back as feedback uh, it's really, it's really nice and uh, heartening to hear. Is many of the young employees who are young parents um, who have volunteered and spent time come back to us saying that uh, you know we've learned to sort of become better parents to our kids uh, thanks to the kind of work we do, uh, you know, through Toy Bank. So uh, that's the, one of the best uh, uh, conversations and feedback that we've had with some of the employee volunteers. Um, because what better, what what a better thing to to, to feel, and also the mindfulness. Sure. Like our approach at Toy Bank, what we call is it's the it's the conscious play approach. It's not just about hey you gave a toy, you give a board game, and it's kind of your job is done. But it's a very conscious play approach. You mindfully sit and you you solve out for these games. So a lot of these young people who come into our centers, interact with our kids, are also understanding the importance of um you know truly being empathetic it's not just just saying it because it looks and feels good or sounds good but it's it's about truly like feeling the empathy levels and being able to uh, uh you know sort of um, uh, help the children solve out help them see the world in a different way uh which is more accepting uh for themselves so for the volunteers for the employees and many of these corporates we work with they definitely have become more mindful, if I may say so. Um, there's a lot of sure. value, uh, uh, um, what do you call, um, that, that they imbibe as a way of their own working styles uh, in their jobs. Um, it's, it's also just recently we did a power of play workshop for a bunch of employee volunteers. And one of the things, uh, digitally, in fact, we did this. And uh, typically, we have a very big nice. part of the session. It's amazing. And, uh, you know, the thing is that the, everybody in this pandemic has been struggling with uh, spending time with kids because the work has become so much more digitally and its parenting has become very difficult. With, so one sure. of the things that they went back saying is how important it is for them to, to spend more quality time uh, with their children and not just in terms of... Uh, 
you know, uh, uh, just being there physically, but actually doing something with the kids, whether it's playing, whether it's creating new things, whether it's taking a walk, sharing stories. And I think those are some amazing um, conversations and feedback that we've had. And also mindset changes. Yes. I think that's the most important. Correct. The way you see play, it's not one of those things that, oh, it's just one of the side things. Oh, play, now, nah, big deal. It's a side thing. It's the most important thing. We come from a crazy world of obsessive thinking that play will solve each and every problem in this world. I'm not kidding you. Uh, we really, we believe in that I'm in sure. this organization. So like every, every, every human being in this workplace, every team member, we truly understand this. There's some this deep understanding of mental well-being in children through play and early childhood mental well-being is super important. Play does that. So we Absolutely. put play first and then comes food. <laughs> so we are a little bit extreme when it comes to those things. Because mental, uh, mental uh, hunger is worse off because then you're creating, like you're preparing a terrible environment because these are the young kids who grow up into young sure. violent adults. And that's it. That there, there goes your society. So, yeah. So it's been, uh, it's been some good mm -hmm. feedback. By the way, we've also got bad feedback. Uh, when I say bad, in the sense, the, a lot of people do come back saying, uh, "What's it? What's play? How is that so important?" So we've also had that kind of feedback. Where in India the poverty levels are so extreme that it becomes difficult to buy food and clothes and a pair of chappals, shoes. Correct. What are you talking about play? But that's it, right? We have a contra contrary uh, argument about this. That you know, uh, uh, if somebody does not have money enough to buy shoes and food. Then we better provide them with more play. That that is what they, they, you know, whatever money they save, let them buy the food, let them buy the shoes, let them buy whatever else they need. We will fill this gap of the play aspect for these young kids because it really is something that will help the children to think better. You're sowing the seeds at a very young age. Their minds open up. They're able to be more accepting of their lives around them. They're more open to learning. The fear of sure. learning dies. So we've seen a lot of impact of of uh, of play and, and even in the in the lives of young people who volunteer with us it's amazing and I, I i think you you've kind of nailed that point which again based on your experience based on what you see with the kids and you hear the importance for parents to spend that quality time with children because that's what at the end of the day helps to develop that child um, you know, the direction, the choices that they make once they grow up will all depend on the kind of relationship they have with their parent. And, and I guess play is a great way um, of, of sort of building that interaction, that trust and the relationship. You know, just I am mindful of time. So, you know, a couple of quick ones, I suppose, before we kind of wind up. But, you know, looking at you picking this up at a young age, um, you know, having this, what are your, you know, getting people to support an NGO or a charitable organization um, as a, as a one-off thing, as a by the way thing, maybe a little easier. Somebody could say, you know, when I have a little bit of time once a month, once a week, I could go in and do this. But looking at the impact that you've created, because you've chosen this as your primary and the only role rather than a by the way what's the kind of advice you would have for for youngsters especially who want to look at doing things back for you know giving back to the society um doing things that really matter that impact lives of you know whether it's the underprivileged or otherwise but what's your advice for for youngsters and for those who haven't or maybe are thinking about voluntary work or, or, you know, that kind of activity? Um, I will uh, I'll answer this with a very, very simple and a quick story. Uh, and I think you'll get the message. You know, once uh, there was uh, there was a king who, um, there, so there, there was a lot of uh, lack of food because I think that particular village had a very bad season. And so the farms were destroyed and there was a big food crisis. Um, this king came up with an idea saying that, hey, let's, there's this well. Uh, can we all put, uh, you know, uh, a bottle of milk into this well overnight so that uh, 
every one of us can pull in and the children at least will be able to get milk uh, the next day. So I, the idea was for all the households to find a bottle, I mean, from their own homes, put a bottle of milk into that well and fill it up with milk. The next morning when the king came to see that well, uh, it was filled with water. There was no milk. And it turns out that overnight, everybody said, oh, I will put water now. My neighbor will put milk. What's the big deal? There'll be some milk of some sort. And everybody thought this and nobody got milk and there was only water in that well. So nobody wins. And uh, it, this, is a, this stayed with me. It was a story I heard when I was young. It uh, got me thinking because, you see, we're living in times that it's, there is no time for later. There is no time for I will do something when I can or later on. I think everybody is capable of doing something now. It's not always about the money. If it's for young people starting enterprises or business plans or having business ideas and things like that, why not integrate this into the business plan? Why is this always separate? Why is it? Why is serving humanity or being, uh, you know, bringing the human element in whatever we do? Why can it just not be integrated? Why is it made such a big deal? Aren't they all humans? Didn't somebody help us at some point at some life? Whether it's not me directly, maybe my ancestors. God only knows. You couldn't have just been born like this, right? I mean, there must have been so many others who may have. You understand that whole aspect, we forget where we came from and what our roots are. And there must have been some great grandfather somewhere or grandmother somewhere who must have burned and toiled to, for us to be able to benefit some life that we're living today. So what I'm going to say is that it's extremely important for us to A, not take things for granted, that there'll be time and I can do it later. There is no time. The sense of urgency should be in all of us. And two is, why not integrate this in the way we think in our day-to-day -day lives? It's so easy. And it's so important. And this is, as I said earlier, if you help others, you're really actually helping yourself. You're making just the world better around you by being kinder to it. It just it just becomes better for everybody. So that's the only thing I would like to say. And it's, it's, it feels, feels very obvious to me, but I'm sure it's not that easy to implement for many. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right on that. And, and, and thank you so much. I think that story goes a long way and, and and I guess it is what it is. Um, you don't need to explain that. Um, so, you know, with, with Toy Bank, before we, we wrap up, what's next for Toy Bank? I know you've got yourself in six locations or six cities, but what's next for Toy Bank? Where do you hope to see Toy Bank? I think, uh, but there are two things to this. One is we are really pushing hard to mainstream play in India. It's not just, it doesn't even feature sometimes in those drop down boxes and forms that we fill in government and stuff. So why is play never there? Why is play just about, and play, you know, it's not just about having swings and slides in and having a play space in a ground, but can we create an environment that's programmed for play naturally? So one of the key things we're looking at is is, is, is mainstreaming play uh, in India, in everything. So integrating it in the schooling systems, in the way teachers teach, in the way children learn, everywhere, even in job interviews, even in like corporate organizations, in the way they conduct meetings, like can we integrate play into everything? So that's one key project we're really focusing on. Second thing is um, we've still not attained the, the numbers we're aspiring for. I mean, um, when you talk about the number of children, uh, that uh, badly need play or badly need childhood, it, the numbers are whooping. So we still have a long way in terms of scaling to do. So the second simultaneous piece that we're all working in this whole strategic piece is coming together is getting ready for a serious scale, uh, scale up of our work um, in India, particularly in India. So these are the two next big things uh, that we're all working towards. And uh, this pandemic or no pandemic, the work just goes on. So that hasn't stopped us from, from working. Great, from a toy bank perspective. But tell us, what's next for Shweta Chari? <laughs> Where from here? Um, I have very many plans <laughs> for myself. I, uh, I, so I did everything out of, uh, a lot of the things that we like I did over the years has got, got to do with intuition, intuitive feeling and all of those things. And like, you know, the, the yearning and desire to, to build a better world and all of those things, uh, very poetic language. But um, 
now I really want to do this even more mindfully. So I've actually, I'm actually studying as, uh, as we speak. Um, I come with an engineering background, so I need to, I'm getting a bit more uh, deeper into behavioral sciences and, uh, uh, you know, truly uh, wanting to be, what do you say, um, like, uh, I, I, I want to be able to speak about um, the impact that play has uh, in the lives of, of people, children, everyone, uh, with a far more, uh, feeling far more educated and qualified. So um, I'm actually educating myself as we speak. And um, my, my, I have a big plan for myself. So <laughs> I, I, I want to be uh, at some point um, really, uh, 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 I mean, toy bank or no toy bank, I definitely want to be somebody who's um, going to be responsible in some way to create a dent in the way everybody thinks in this, especially in our country. Uh, uh, in terms of driving change, but with the play element uh, somewhere. Sure. So it's 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 a long big one. So let's see how that goes. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And we were in conversation with Shweta Chari, the co-founder and CEO at Toy Bank Development Through Play. Toy Bank is an initiative under the Open Tree Foundation. Uh, is an organization in India that promotes the right to play for all children. And as I said, development through play is their tagline. It provides a platform to all individuals from all ages to participate in this movement of propagating the right to childhood. This is founded in 2004 by Shweta Chari and is headquartered now in Mumbai with a presence in Pune, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Delhi, Goa, and Bhutan. Shweta, thank you so much for carving out a moment in time from your undoubtedly busy schedule. We really, really do appreciate that. And I can honestly say that this has been a thrilling ride indeed. What a story and certainly what an inspiration. So on that note, I bid everyone a wonderful rest of the day. Stay safe, stay productive.